The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been been warned. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Just Some Podcasts. This is Tom. Hey, this is Ben. Tom, how's it going, man? It is going swell, and I am super excited to tell everybody that we have one of our favorite special guests back tonight. We have Jeff with us tonight, Mr. Jeff. Hello. We're going to keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man of many words there. Just hello. Yeah, there you go. Yes. <laughs> uh, you should appreciate the uh, joke from, uh, what was it, Major League? The best color man in baseball. There you go. <laughs> best color man in baseball. That way we don't have to go that OH thing again. <laughs> yeah. Be careful what you wish for there, Jeff. Uh, I'll tell you I about know. that off air. So... Uh, <laughs> No, it's been an interesting uh, day, as I was telling you guys off air. It it turned into a literal World War II battle in the express care today. But uh, other than that, it's been a pretty good uh, couple days since the last time we spoke. Been looking at a lot of the old influenza. And, of course, I'm waiting for the influx of panic due to the Wuha or Wuhan uh, coronavirus that the CDC has now reported (laughs) is in America. So thank you, CDC. Yes. See your influenza and raise you pertussis. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, we've had an outbreak of that last year in this area. So we had it a couple of years ago. Z pack for everybody. It's like, you get a Z pack, <laughs> you get a Z pack. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is, who are, who are you going to decide to test? I mean, geez, everybody who's coming in with a cough and a cold right now, hey, great time of year for pertussis. Yeah, right. <laughs> I like to go with the, I'm guessing everybody has it, Jeff. And uh, so therefore everybody gets Z-Packs at this point. So. That's right. I'm, I wrote 47 Z-Packs today. It was a hell of a day. <laughs> but so, your press gainy is going to go way up. Just think about that. Uh, yeah. So. Everybody's going to be happy. You stub well, your toe. I Antibiotic for you. Yeah, nobody's going to get better, but they're going to be happy about it. Well, that's what they call to. They'll call and schedule in three days. Hey, I'm not any better. How long have you been sick? Five days total. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. And the matter they get when you're like, but you don't need this. Eh, whatever. But uh, no, that's how things have been here. How are uh, things going where you're at, Mr. Jeff? About the same, although I keep getting hammered with my chronic care patients. So we've got a couple of newer providers still that don't have a huge patient base. They're developing a nice base. But I came at the right time that I inherited a lot of patients from two outgoing providers. So their schedule starts off empty and they might fill up with a bunch of acutes. And my schedule fills up with chronic after chronic after chronic after chronic, which ends up being a very long day. Yeah, that sounds like it. <laughs> I, there's no comment there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can a few words as well. Chronic. I know how chronic care is. I get it. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's it's good that they follow up routinely like they're supposed to. Yeah. But yeah. I'm in that weird in between where I'm transitioning into the primary care and I'm inheriting that. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I thought it was uh, about time for you to switch over. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's super exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that where you feel like you're getting to do newer things where mm-hmm. I'm getting to take care of those chronic conditions, even though I learned that training 
and doing some of those things and getting to help out with it over the past couple of years, you still feel like you've lost some of it when you don't do mm -hmm. it every day. And so now it's like, oh, I get to do it again. But then listening and talking to you guys off the air, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that part. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it's still every time I get to learn something new, as much as I like to bitch, every time I do get to learn something new, I actually am super excited. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this next step in the career. So just to clarify, you're still in walk in with like one stethoscope, like half a tongue depressor <laughs> and two otoscope tips, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like. <laughs> It's a roughly yes. We'll just stick with that. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And 75 people that I'm like, no, you're, you're fine. But yeah, whatever. It's, it's all, it's all good right now. So sharing that one, that one otoscope speculum. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, make Dr. sure you Ring wash that off. off really good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're sticking that where. We're going to need a lot more alcohol swabs. I'm just <laughs> not sure that's in the budget. Swabs yeah. for everybody. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. You think I, I got to use both sides of this thing now? So I know it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get uh, that one side to, to fit on the end of the otoscope, though. <laughs> yeah. Keep trying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So. Mr. Jeff, before we do our social media, is there anything you want to shout out tonight? Get your flu shots if you haven't gotten your flu shot. I think that one kind of goes without saying, and we'll just spare ourselves the other argument. And uh, don't forget to support your local photographer. Oh, there you go. There you go. Hey, I, I was going to go on this big farmer rant, but you know what? Support your local photographer. I like that. Thank you. Well... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is trying to figure that one out. I'll talk to you guys about it out of off the air. Oh no, I know, I know. I just was like, yeah, hey, no, no, I like that. Yeah, it, it just caught me off guard. That's all. So, if I you was... like the show, you can find what. Go ahead. What? Nothing. I just I threw you off on accident. I didn't even mean to throw you off. <laughs> <laughs> Should we start keeping track? Yeah. Uh... No, the editing process is going to be so awesome. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, me, 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 me. If you like Go ahead. Show, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, all at Just Some Podcast. You can find us on the web. We're at www.justsomepodcast.com. Or you can email us, admin at justsomepodcast.com. Don't forget, you can also find us on Helium Radio. We're on Helium Radio after our channel two, Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central. See what the people are not hearing, or what they won't hear is, uh, Tom and Jeff are talking in my ears, trying to screw me up. So, Helium Radio, iHeartRadio app, anywhere that you can find a podcast, we are going to be there. Tom, what else can they do other than you try to screw me up in my ears? What's up? Well, first of all, they can go to the Just Some Podcast website, and just about towards the bottom, they can go scrolling towards the bottom, and they can click on the Amazon affiliate link before they do any of their shopping. And then when they go do their shopping, it costs them nothing. And then that, and then at that point, it will help us out. <laughs> and uh, I can't really hear what's going on. I take my headphones off because these dickwads keep talking while I'm trying to do stuff. And then uh, I'm sure I said something, blah, blah, blah. Something helped the show. We'd really appreciate it. I don't know what else. So that's the end of my spiel. Amazon. That's where you're at. I don't know what you said, but yes. So Amazon. Sure. Amazon. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Something Amazon. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. There you go. So I'm done. Still get, We're still getting lots of activity on that. So it's it's good. We like to like seeing people buying stuff off our link. We love seeing that. And while I don't know who bought it, Whoever bought the three pairs of extra small golf pants, I don't know what you're doing with them, but you know, let's hang out. If they're extra small, nothing is hanging out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or everything is hanging out. One of the two. <laughs> See, exactly. Like I don't know which one, but let's. Hey, where's, where's that going? So, and that pink and blue plaid will come back into style. Don't worry. Just, it will absolutely. <laughs> all right, Tom. Oh, it's gonna be a hell of an episode. Oh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna Are be you ready to get to the story? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm trying to talk over you guys, and it didn't work. I should have took my headphones off like Tom did. So it'll be a... – yeah. All right. You ready to get into stories you may have missed? Absolutely. Tom, 
You work walk in, yes? Uh, that is correct, sir. So, I'm gonna just I'm gonna make an assumption that you have heard a patient tell you when they take their temperature or when you when your MA takes their temperature. What? Go ahead. You're you're nodding your head. <laughs> but I I, I know it? both what you're about to say and the story, so I just read it today. So go on. No, no. <laughs> yes, yeah. please continue. Can I guess? Go ahead, Jeff. Guess. I already. My normal it. temperature is X, Y, Z. So this has to be a fever for me. Do I win? It is where I was going. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So there was a story that came out in regards to body temperature and what the new normal is. Originally in 1851, a German physician, Carl Reinhold August Wunderlich, that's a hell of a name. Uh, he surveyed 25,000 people in one city and established that 37 degrees Celsius was the standard temperature for the human body. 37 degrees Celsius does come out to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. However, recent analysis and surveys suggest the average body temperature is now lower. There was a study of 35,000 people in the United Kingdom and over 250,000 temperature measurements that show that the new body temperature is 36.6 degrees Celsius, which is going to be 97.88. Oh, good Some Lord. of the... <laughs> see, it drops significantly. So what has caused this? Uh, the environment that we've lived in has changed. Temperature of our, our homes, our contact with microorganisms, the food that we have access to. We also uh, don't have to use as much energy. So our metabolic rates have dropped, which can also cause a decrease in the temperature. And we have air conditioning and heating, which have resulted in a more consistent ambient temperature, making it unnecessary to expend energy to maintain the same body temperature. So, Tom, the next time they come in and say that my body temperature is lower than 98.6 degrees normally, they might be onto something. So, I would like to point <laughs> out that yes. I've never really argued with somebody that their temperature might be slightly lower than 98.6, but that when they say... That means a 99 is a raging fever. I'm no. That's the that's going to be the issue. Is what is it? What's the new fever? Correct. But the problem is, is until all of medicine adopts a new standard, I don't think that we can all arbitrarily just start doing it. Right now, it's still 100.4. Until we all adopt a new standard, I'm not going to say, well, so sucks to suck. I don't know what to tell them. So when they come to me with when Jeff decides what the new standard is and medicine adopts it, that's when I'll start using it. There you go. So Jeff, what do you think the new standard is? What's the new fever, Jeff? Uh, it is whatever the patient says it is, just like their pain. <laughs> oh God, what a <laughs> bullshit answer! <laughs> you know, I I foresee no problems with that ten years from now. Yeah, exactly, none, none, none whatsoever. None. Yeah. No. Yes. In the Ooh. ER and triage, I always loved it when they're like, it's 10 out of 10 while they're giggling, playing on their phone. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's whatever they say it is. Right. Yeah. Nicely played, sir. Yes, so, exactly. Tom, that was, you are welcome. Was that the story that you uh, had read? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't remember the exact numbers, but I, yes, I, I read that story today. And that is something. I think every person that has worked as a nurse <laughs> or in this field has heard at some point, well, I know my body. I'm like, oh, oh Lord, here <laughs> it comes. You know, like, here it comes. So do you ever have to stop yourself from from making an inappropriate response on that one? Yes. And sometimes I failed. And I have... <laughs> I've never done anything inappropriate like that I couldn't defend verbally, but I will say that I know that my face has definitely betrayed my true inner self far more than my words mm -hmm. could ever do. So the eye roll, the yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So I've I've had many a person that was in the room with me, they were like, Do you realize what your face did when they said that? I uh, but I try and be nice. They, I understand that the patient doesn't feel well. I do try and deal with that. But at the same time, sometimes it does get a little thick. Fair enough. 
Well, you ready to dip into our main topic? I'm ready. Jeff, are you ready? Absolutely. Okay. I was born for this. So, well, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, so, you need a new guest. Why didn't we bring him on then? <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> I don't know. I thought it was like a good idea at the time. <laughs> oh, really? Just like, just like, yes. the, some... <laughs> just like the DOT episode. Shut up. Yes. <laughs> Next time we want to hear a drunk DOT episode live. Oh, yeah. There just take go. both of our bad ideas and put them together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, only if Jeff comes on with us. So there you go. I, I will stay out of that one. <laughs> hey, how about you just moderate it? You could just be on it with me <laughs> while I'm drunk. I don't care. <laughs> I really want to do uh, an an episode like that, though. I yeah, I, yeah. I think we need to do one soon. I'm just saying, we'll see. All Maybe right. a movie so, review while while we're drinking, huh? Huh? Yeah. No, we'll talk okay. about it. Just, oh, okay. So, Tom, this is the episode that we have talked a lot about. This, other than uh, the vaccine episode, this is probably the other one that we have talked the most about. Hey, we're going to do this at some point, and so. I thought, you know what? It's finally time to bite the bullet and just uh, do it. So, how to get a hooker? Uh, <laughs> used to be Craigslist, I believe, but I'm not sure what they use now. Um, and that's a short Good episode. Recovery. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Play the music. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, we want to talk about education. And then this episode, we wanted to bring Jeff on and kind of get his opinions as well. Because, um, as Jeff has demonstrated, he's a very educated man. I mean, he may not always act like it, but he is. And uh, <laughs> so this episode, the plan is to kind of cover nursing school, ADN, BSN, kind of our, some of our thoughts and opinions on that. And then uh, the next episode or the next couple episodes, depending on how long we go, will be the nurse practitioner, MSN, DNP type episodes. So here's my question for you to start this off and then we will just kind of uh, see where the conversation goes from here. Cause we really don't have a, a script or anything on this episode. I was thinking about this the other day. So, you know, you hear about workplace violence and I know Tom, that's something that's near and dear to your heart as we have talked about on that episode. And we kind of briefly mentioned like lateral violence and, and some issues there. And, you know, there's the quote unquote nurses eat your young and kind of the bullying and things like that. So at what point, given the current state of healthcare, do you think that that becomes a common core curriculum in a nursing school to like teach them that, Hey, this is going to happen to you and ways that you can combat it. Certainly think that there was issues when I was a nurse. And I know that I've had issues as a practitioner with certain other providers making comments either to me or about me. So, I mean, my question then is to you is, so at what point do you think that it just becomes, it's something that happens in healthcare as we know, and it's becoming more frequent. So when does it just become part of the vernacular of this is just the way that it is? Well, first of all, I think it should just always be uh, the workplace violence, especially in healthcare. It should be part of our curriculum from the very beginning. As far as I think that's where we need to separate the issue, though, uh, just a little bit okay. is the it should be part of the training, both on the patient, the patient visitor and the lateral side of workplace violence, because those are those are the three different areas that you're going to get the workplace violence. Well, I guess there, you can throw in a fourth, which is the random act. Um, you know, the, yeah. the thing that you can't plan for the, the gunman that just walks in that has no association with the hospital. Those, those types of things do happen, but outside of those types of acts of violence, you said something about the fact of like, we eat our young. And honestly, I don't think that we should blindly accept it, but to not prepare nurses for the fact that that may happen. I also think is a failure on our part. I think that we should be trying to do something as a culture that says, Hey, perhaps there is a better way to do things, but I don't think you can eliminate it either. So I think that there is a constant conversation that we can have. I don't think that it's something that we can totally accept. However, to just blindly let students go out there unprepared that this is going to happen is also a failure on our part We've done multiple presentations on workplace violence. And I guarantee you every one of them 
I have included that. Like, this is going to happen. It's not an if, it's a when. These things are going to happen. So you need to be prepared for these things. And there is no, there is no set plan. If you try and make a set plan, you're going to fail because it's just not going to work. All plans seem really great till you get punched in the face is, you know, the old Mike Tyson saying, you know, yeah, it just yeah. that that's how it works. So I, I think that there needs to be a, a minor separation of that question into two parts of we do need to be teaching from the very beginning about workplace violence and having a separate conversation about what is acceptable. And that's that's the way I look at it. And I, I also came from a different background, as everybody knows, the law enforcement, you know, you have that as well. And I think it was a much more accepted hazing ritual in law enforcement to the rookie got beat up. And I don't mean, well, sometimes physically <laughs> beat up, <laughs> but there was also a reasoning for that. It was like a stress induction, right? Like it was to put you under stress to teach you how to deal with it. In nursing, it seems like they just like to pick on people. And I'm like, that's not the same thing. Like when I was a rookie officer, the older guys did stuff like that to you or put you in the crappy situations. One, because you had to earn your right to not do the crappy things. And two, it put you in stress and you had to learn how to deal with it. And they helped you learn. When I got into nursing, it just seemed like they wanted to be assholes. And I'm like, man, that's not quite the same thing. And so I, I think that those are the two things we need to focus on when it comes to that. Subject. Okay, let me ask you this about the teaching about workplace violence. If you're going to separate them out into two different things, what are you wanting to teach? It, the nickel version. Do you, you mean like what would I want to teach if I was like to an ADN class? Yeah, because you just got that. You just said that you want to teach about workplace violence. Well, so are you talking about teaching? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So there's no way you can really teach. Like I can't teach you how to do jujitsu. Like I, I there's, we can't do that. Okay. What I can teach you is that this is going to happen. Here is the most realistic or maybe even realistic. If I could speak correctly, realistic aspects of words are hard. Words are very hard. Uh, realistic aspects of that type of violence. Like what is, what's most realistic? All right. Like I told you Creighton university in Nebraska had like a gunman come in and shoot. All right. That happened. Okay, but that was a situation that was isolated to that incident, right? Like that's an unusual case for what happened there versus Unfortunately, not as unusual as it used to be. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's I guess that's one way of putting it. But what I'm saying is, is that is still less common than the patient that is drunk and punching the nurses because he's not getting his way. And so okay. what, what I would say is here, what is the most typical thing? You're going to get verbally abused. That is going to happen. You may get physically threatened. That actually happened tonight. There was a, basically a, a verbal threat to a staff member at my clinic. So what I would say is we can't exactly teach everybody the fundamentals of self-defense. It, there's legal aspects and ramifications and time. We just don't, we just don't have the ability to do all that. But what we can do is say, here is what is likely to happen and what you probably should have in your mind to prepare for it so that the first time they see it isn't when it happens. You know, a 19 year old girl, the first time some guy, you know, tries to sexually assault her by grabbing her vagina I would like her to know that that's a possibility before the first time it happens. So that maybe when she walks into the room, she's thinking, Hey, this guy's drunk. Maybe I should be self-aware of what this guy could do to myself instead of just walking in there. And then she ends up assaulted. And so those are the types of things I would say is I can't teach her how to defend herself physically, but maybe mentally prepare for what's going to happen. And the best defense is always avoidance. Mm -hmm. just not be there. The best way to win any fight is not to be in the fight. <laughs> Makes sense. And, I mean, that goes way, way back, you know? So that's what I would say as far as the teaching aspects are be aware of what the most common ways of getting hurt are and the, you know, what are the most dangerous situations to be in and how to avoid them. 
What about recognizing? I, th I think if you're going to talk about teaching, I think talking about early recognition and then teaching skills for de-escalation. Now, granted, there are going to be some situations where you absolutely cannot de-escalate right. the other party. I mean, they are just, they're just there, whether it's a psychosis, whether it's a drug overdose that has induced the behavior, it's recognition so that you can start avoiding. And I think that's one of the, one of our failings. And I think that's probably fair to say across the board with as much as common as workplace incidents have become and not just, and we say workplace, but I don't really think it's workplace specific. I think that just happens to be where we are when somebody has made that choice to become violent. I think that if they were at a nightclub and decided to become violent, then it would be nightclub violence. I don't think it's specific right. about workplace. It's got a nice connotation. We can try and regulate the heck out of employers to say, you have to provide this training, you have to provide this training but it doesn't provide prevention. And I, I think training and recognition and de-escalation is where we need to look, especially on our young, on our young nurses. I would say the part on the training of de-escalation should probably fall to the employer just because they will have their own risk management and stuff involved. And it's, I, I would find it almost impossible for a school to be able to apply something to every aspect. If we're talking about an education, and I'm going to disagree with you there. I think you can introduce it and teach some techniques. And the biggest technique people need to learn is how to de-escalate themselves. Because it's very easy to be in that situation and see somebody start to escalate and automatically become defensive. And so you just have two people that are just gradually stepping up, stepping up. If you can teach early on how people can kind of recenter themselves and calm, them, calm themselves down, not necessarily specific skills for for an employer, but in order to to learn how to de-escalate themselves so that they can start to do something differently. And I think if it's introduced early on, when you've got somebody who's going into clinicals, because clinicals can be really stressful for yeah. nursing students also. And just because they're in clinical doesn't mean they're going to be sheltered from violence. And if you get, if you're able to start teaching that there where they are safe, where they can be removed from a situation to have a more experienced person handle the issue, I think that piece of the training would be invaluable because once they get onto the unit and they're being employed, they don't have a safety net anymore. I, I don't disagree with you in that aspect. What I guess I mean is, yes, we can teach recognition, but what I mean is as far as de-escalation processes, stuff like that. Sure. But I mean, there are specific like uh CPI is a specific company that provides, mm -hmm. if we're talking about specifics like that, I, I don't think that schools can give that broad of a, I think that is something that has to be specifically left up to the employer. I think I agree. that the, the school can do a good job of saying, Hey, here are the most dangerous aspects. Like if you're on labor and delivery, you know, you're in a high stress environment. These are the things that you should be watching for. These are the things that you can do to deescalate. But then when it comes down to the specifics of how to deescalate it, each hospital are going to have their own procedures, protocols, etc., of how they want things handled. Like I've worked in a hospital where they literally almost had zero security at some point. I've worked in a hospital where they had full-fledged sworn police officers, very completely different environment. So that's what I'm saying is it would be impossible for one school to tell students how to react. That would apply to both of those situations. Well, so, and I think if you're just dealing with the emotional side of the response, I think that's, that's the correct. piece I'm coming from is you, yes. if you can teach that, start to teach that emotional side, these other pieces like CPIs, I think I worked many moons ago as a living group home manager with developmentally disabled adults who have behavioral issues and outbursts. And we were trained in MANT, M-A-N-D-T, that yes. uh, de-escalation system. So I don't really think teaching hands-on is appropriate yeah. for a nursing school. Me neither. I, think I don't. That, that learning how to recognize the signs in another person and the signs in yourself that you're both people are starting to escalate and how to handle yourself and how to start talking 
other people down, you know, speaking quieter, backing up a little bit, making sure that you're staying open and not crossing your arms and avoiding taking a more aggressive posture, things that we do without really realizing we're doing them. If we can teach that when these going to say kids, because I've got too many years on them anymore, (laughs) when these kids are in a more protected, safe environment, I think that will help them go far once they're on that unit and they're in a situation where they've got no backup whatsoever. No, hundred percent. How do you think? Go on, Ben. Uh, I was just going to ask, how do you think that translates then into lateral violence or the hazing or the uh, nurse bullying or whatever, whatever you want to call it? I mean, there's not really a, I mean, yeah, you can be, you can be, you know, self-aware of it, uh, but you, there's really not much de-escalation if the entire, you know, cause you, nursing is clicky by nature. You know, you have your, your nurses yeah. who are clicky, you have ICU that's click, you have OR that's clicky. I mean, so there's not really a de-escalation to that. So how do you think that would translate into that? As experienced nurses, why are we tolerating it from other experienced that, nurses? That's, that's where it yeah. starts. I would say, that's what I would say. It's a cultural issue. And that's what I was trying to say before is I've dealt with two cultures that have it and it was vastly different. In one culture, it was used as a, almost as another training tool. And it was tolerated because we actually used it to groom the person like, Hey, this makes you part of us. It was not something to shun you. It was something to make you feel belonged versus nursing. It was strictly to make you feel ostracized. And I could not understand it. And I'll be honest, I feel the three of us probably got it less in some ways and more in some ways, strictly because we are men. I think that there was a lot of flack we didn't catch because we are men. And I think that there are times where we were specifically excluded because we are men. And so that gives us a different variable than I think women would have out looking on this as well. Fair fair point. I think culturally nursing has something to say about this, but when you were teaching kids, I would say the same thing as Jeff on that one. When we're teaching kids about this, I would say the same thing. What, how do you recognize what is about to happen? So when this older nurse who's supposed to be your preceptor is doing this, how do you handle the situation? That's what we should be teaching them. Because one of the first things I would tell you that they should be handling it is their ability to react and deal with the situation. One of the reasons that these older nurses are doing this is because no one's stopping them. So when this kid comes up and says, I know you're not supposed to be doing this, you're supposed to be training me and you're not handling the situation correctly. You need to be taking care of the situation. It puts them on the spot. That can be the type of thing that could help correct the situation. Not always. But it can be the type of thing where maybe the older nurse goes, well, crap. Okay. You know, I can't, maybe I can't get away with it with this one because if she can continually beat up that younger nurse, she's going to. So just like he was saying before, recognizing what's going on and then dealing with it. That's what I'm saying is we need to be teaching these, these kids how to recognize what the problem is going to be so that they can then learn how to deal with it. Whether the violence is interior or exterior, it's the same process. It's the same OODA loop. You have to figure out where the threat is, orient yourself to it, and then decide what you're going to do about it before you act. I mean, it's the same process, whether it's lateral or not. Okay. Now let me speak to what you just said. You're a 22 year old, you're a 23 year old, male or female, doesn't matter. You are mm-hmm. fresh out of school and you are the brand new guy on the unit. How confident are you to be able to look at somebody who's got 10, 15 years experience on you to say, Hey, back off. It's exactly. that is hard to do. I, I would agree. That's where, that's where we as older nurses have to see what's happening and step in, intervene on their behalf and intercede. 100% agree. And that's why, that's why I said first, I think that this is a cultural issue. We as nurses need to be dealing with from the top down. I think that's the primary thing, but if the younger nurses don't know how to recognize it and come to somebody and say, Hey, I need help or 
at least step to that person and say, Hey, I need you to teach me instead of doing this. I don't know how they're going to be able to deal with it further. Let's say you, you control everything. I don't know. Ooh, that's a scary thought for Tom. What are some changes if you had the ability to do, what are some changes that you would make? Like say in a typical ADN program, what are some typical changes I would make in an ADN program? Yeah, so you had the ability to make changes to all ADN programs across the, the cross country world, whatever the case may be. If you had the ability, what are some changes that you would make? If any, very, very first thing, get rid of a lot of the focus on theory, get rid of the focus on theory and actually focus on getting down to the nuts and bolts of direct patient care in an ADN program. Yeah. They already, they are much more focused on patient care than somebody moving into a BSN than a base BSN program. I'm telling you right now, I remember having to go over all the different theories and stuff. And, and I, I would much rather spend that time focused on, learning more about how to actually take care of my patients than learning about how to ask them how they felt about how I took care of them. Uh, another thing I directly remember about my ADN program is they drilled into my head. You are not here to diagnose. You are not here to diagnose. You are not here to diagnose. They said that like a thousand times a day. You are not here to diagnose. And then every nursing question on the test was they have a blood pressure of 138. What's wrong with them? What the hell? literally everything about this seems like you're asking me to diagnose something. I, I don't know. It, it just seems like it seems backwards. When I talk to paramedics and you ask them about how they do their testing, it seems much more direct. You have a patient with a gross deformity to their left ankle. You know, what should you be doing? It's about how to check pulses. It's about, do we do traction, etc. cetera? Mm -hmm versus EMS is a whole different it's a whole different ball of wax correct but it's still more about how to actually affect patient care fixing that foot i think you're well, true, but it's more specialized it, it is more specialized that would be if it was an er or adn program or okay uh, or ADN program. i guess that's why i am a little because i've only done icu and er primarily so when I had that, that's primarily what I was focused on versus learning about the theory about how to do patient care. Jeff, what, 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 would, what would you change if you had the ability to change anything in an ADN program? An ADN program? Yes. I'm going to invoke the wrath of Tom. No, no, no. <laughs> I would actually say I want a little bit more theory, but let me qualify that. I'm not talking Lillian Wald type theory. I'm not talking about the theorists. I'm talking more about application of critical thinking skills and teaching those kinds of critical thinking skills. So the questions you were talking about, all these questions on your test say, I'm supposed to diagnose, I'm supposed to diagnose. I think it's geared more towards predict what's going on so you can anticipate the next need. I think that presentation gets lost because folks are so focused on the question. Okay. So let me rephrase what I was saying. I'm not against us getting all the information and actually predicting. Cause I can't tell you how many times a physician was like, Hey, what's going on in that room? And we were de facto eyes and ears. And I, obviously they made the final mm -hmm. decision, but we gave them a heads up. But if you don't know what you're telling them yeah. and what's important to tell them, what? I no 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 hold on let let me that's what I'm saying let me rephrase what I was getting at I'm not opposed to us having those critical thinking skills what I'm saying is the ADN school was drilling into your head that's not your job that's not your job that's not your job and then gives you that question maybe we should start saying hey you are going to be doing these types of things this is the way you should be thinking about things and I apologize if that's how they said things, because all I got out of it was don't diagnose anything. But then that's the only question I got. So maybe we need to work on how we communicate to the students the information we're trying to get from them. 
because I for two this- years, because for two years, I got into my head drilled over and over and over that this is not your scope of practice. You are not here to diagnose, but he's got a blood pressure of 200 over 100. What's wrong with him? Didn't you just tell me not to diagnose him, but you're asking me to tell you what's wrong with him. I understand what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying. But what I'm saying is we're, we're asking students to not use critical thinking skills and then giving them questions that are based on critical thinking skills is that's what it feels like to me is we're giving them mixed messages. Like, Hey, I want you to use critical thinking, but I'm not going to say use critical thinking. Maybe we need to directly say it like that. Like, hey, I expect you to use critical thinking skills. Time to start doing it. Okay. So I think what you're talking about is an issue with teaching style and presentation. I agree. We get, we hear all through nursing school, don't diagnose the patients when you're using a nursing diagnosis, which that's a whole other land of terminology that we need to address. (laughs) Yes. But when we're... What their care plans? That would be mine. That's what I would want in care plans. Just yeah, thank you. I'll let you address that. Once we start teaching these folks what they're doing, the expectation on the unit is very different now than what it was when some of the folks who are teaching were on a unit, and I do think there is some disparity there that they recognize, hey, this is what we used to do. This is, hey, what we used to do. We may see the science evolve, but it's the art that they kind of miss. And what physician expectation is, is it's changed. I mean, physician ex- expectation used to be that we were seen and not heard. We did exactly what we were told when we were told to do it. And we s- stood up and gave them our chair. Yeah. <laughs> what the expectation now is that we recognize when folks are starting to get in trouble and what may be happening. And if we don't start teaching how to think those pieces through, we're going to be in trouble when we're 30 years older and needing somebody to take care of us in the hospital. A hundred percent agree for a short period of time. I floated in, in a hospital. Like I said, primarily I see you in the ER. And a hundred percent when I called the the physician or I spoke to him, generally it was like, Hey, this is what's happened. This is where it's going. They already had the scope. Here's the curve. This is where we're traveling and we could come up with a plan together. I mean, obviously he made the final call, but I was going to be carrying out the mission. I kind of gave him the lay of the land. That's how it worked together. It usually worked very well. I will tell you when I went to like the med surge floors, it seemed to be 1950 again. Mm -hmm. It went very much backwards. And I went to a code where it, I don't blame the nurses. It was not going very well because they did not practice ACLS on a regular basis. They did not Mm -hmm. use those skills on a regular basis. And when physicians come in and they ask the same questions that the, the more experienced nurses we had already asked and we were trying to straighten out for them before they even arrived, They got all sorts of hot. Well, why didn't you know this? Why haven't you done this? And in my head, I was going, you tell these people to not use their critical thinking skills and call you at 2 a.m. for Tylenol orders that you then bitch at them for. But (laughs) in the middle of the code, you expect them to remember ACLS rules that they don't ever use. Like, which one do you want them to do? Do you want them to use critical thinking skills or do you want them to just be the robot? And I, I think that's part of the disparity that we're having is some of the units are very much getting to be the critical thinking skills. And some of the units are still very much be seen and not heard. And I, so what is this an education problem or is this a culture problem? I think it's a cult. I think that is a culture problem. I might've, I might've gone off track a little bit there. I think that's a culture issue that nursing needs to deal with, but I think that's something I wasn't trying to redirect you on it. No, no, I, no. I was just thinking that in school, we're trained on some of this stuff. Yes. And then we end up, I want to say pigeonholed for, for lack of a better term, but I think that may actually be a pretty fair term. Yeah. 
given that a lot of folks, when they go to med surge, stay med surge and they like med surge mm -hmm. and yeah. they like the challenge of med surge and having been in ICU nothing wrong with that. and going to a med surge floor, I couldn't do what they do every night. No, I could not do I that. Couldn't either. I did it for six months and hats off to them because I couldn't, mm. I shouldn't say I couldn't. I did. I was like, look, this is not my deal. Respect to them. It was not, mm -mm. Mm -mm. I did not want to do it anymore. It was not my thing. To the point, if we change what our expectation is for how they work and how they think things through. And I think that's at any <laughs> level of nursing, whether it's a student, whether it's somebody who's been on the floor for two years whether it's somebody who's been on the floor for 10 years, if we change what our expectation is, people will live up to it, but you have to give them that opportunity. Now let's step back a, a minute for looking at, at nursing programs. I think one of the problems that we see are the quality is the, and I'm trying to be very careful here is the quality of education prior to getting to nursing school what what is our expectation for what the student is capable of when they get there versus what the reality of their capabilities are and i think our expectations are a lot higher than what reality is and i think that's where some of the disparity comes in if i've got somebody who i assume has gone through four years of high school two years of college to get to their to get to where they are for a bachelor's program, or if we're going to talk ADN, they've got high school experience, then they're straight into college, and you're looking at a two to three year program there for ADN to, to licensure. How strong are they coming in? And how are we measuring their strength? And what are we doing to help them get better prior to us saying, oh, you're just not good enough. You're not thinking this through enough. I don't know if there is a good one. And honestly, this is probably a better conversation between you and Ben because you guys are farther. I can just tell you from being a student more recently than you two. I will tell you, though, I think based on what we just talked about and some of the things you just said, one of the things that maybe we should address in some way is I think that there are trying to keep this in the education realm that there is a large disparity between reality. And, and this is something that Ben would say to me because he knew me when I was going through school, school world and real world, not the same place. It, it has gotten so far apart that you can't handle them with the same glasses on. That, that is true. The way I think about things when I was dealing with in school is not the same way I actually handled being an actual nurse. And I think that is something that perhaps academia needs to address is that we have gotten that far off track, not perhaps maybe at the, well, to an extent, maybe at the MSN level, but maybe not as much as at the ADN level, but that's maybe something you two, Ben, how would you address that? Well, I, I think in particular because they're teaching to pass boards. I mean, that's the... I mean, that's their ultimate goal is to get you graduated and pass boards. They kind of, as you kind of alluded to in academia, it's you're practicing at like ivory tower general hospital where everything is exactly like it should be. Whenever you administer this medication for hypertension, then their blood pressure is going to go down and that's all that there is to, to it. There's not the consideration of, oh, well, you know, did I just shut their kidneys down because I gave them this or, or it's all practicing within this perfect world. And once you get out, then you realize very quickly that it's not a perfect world and shit goes south real quick. And, and maybe that goes back to what Jeff was saying as far as the critical thinking is there's not we're, – we're teaching to a level of you need to get this to pass this national certification, but then – you don't have the critical thinking to necessarily transpire it into the real world immediately. But are we actually teaching critical thinking skills or are we teaching memorization? I say, I think in some aspects we're teaching to a test and I don't mean, and I'm, I'm not pinpointing any particular school by any means. Uh, I mean, just in generality, 
And I, I think, think it, we as a profession are doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, say, I think it's ADN, BSN, MSN. You're getting educated to pass that test. And then it's like, well, once you get out, then you can really learn how to do this job. Um, and so I think that is somewhat of a, a failure in, in across many levels of academia. I think that's a system problem too. When you look at schools that are gauged strictly on their pass rates, so if they're going to if they're going to maintain accreditation, they've got to have X Y Z pass rate. And if they don't have X Y Z pass rate, then you're looking at a board of nursing, a board of regents, and AACN or whichever accrediting agency accrediting body is going to be coming in to scrutinize what's wrong with the program. And we can air quote air quote wrong on that one until we are able to truly change our focus in teaching from, hey, we need a high first time pass rate to, hey, we need to focus on patients and recognize that the pass rate is just a moment in time. And I do think that that schools try to teach for patient care. I, that yeah. when right. I was in training, absolutely, it was patient focus, patient focus, patient focus. But schools have to have to teach to certain objectives and ter- certain standards and have to be able to show for accreditation that the, this course addresses this standard in this way or this standard in that way. And sometimes that the message of the patient, not lost, but gets trapped in a lot of noise. I, I think to be a standard, yeah. I was to say, I, I would like to point out, I don't think I've ever had a teacher that I don't think cared about patient or patient care. Right. No, I would agree wholeheartedly. I would agree with everything Jeff just said is I, I think it's a, the system has set that there needs to be certain things in the curriculum and the teachers have to then fold that in to the cake batter. And so when they make the cake, I'm like, well, what's that doing in there? (laughs) Like suddenly there's things in here. And I'm like, I don't know what that's in here for that. They had to force in there that we're not exactly sure, even though that wasn't the entire focus. Like I truly believe that those individual teachers are doing their best to try and make sure that patients are truly taken care of. Well, and that's where all the theory comes in is, okay, you have, we're, the educators are supposed to teach nursing theory. Great. We've got several huge overreaching primary theories. And then the, you have your mid range theories that you've got to fold into it, that an accrediting body has said, you have to teach this. And you as a student are saying, why do I have to know this down the line? We're using these theories in practice. We aren't, ju- we just aren't calling them a self-care theory. Fair point. I think there is definitely some something to that. However, I would also say I think that is also based on the student. I think you are a much bigger thinker than some of the people I've met going through nursing school. And some of those people, I'm like, I want them focused on how to do blood pressure. I don't need them focused on the theory of how to do blood pressure. I want them focused on on getting blood pressures down. And once they get that down, we we can we can get that bigger picture. But I but you've got to be able to understand what that pressure means. You've got to be able to understand what that what that means in the grand scheme of things. And so if you've got somebody who let's pick a nurse uh, nursing diagnosis self care deficit. <laughs> Everybody's favorite. Okay. Who doesn't routinely <laughs> take their blood pressure medication. And so recognizing that somebody's blood pressure is 160 over 100, is it a crisis or isn't it? Now, if you see that and all you're doing is you're getting this book that says, this is a bad number, this may be hypertensive urgency, whatever that means, this has to be dealt with. Right. They don't get that thought that this may be a pressure that the patient has been living with because they can't afford their medication. What can we do to help them afford their medication or remember to take their medication? If what happens if we go ahead and give them the hydralazine or uh, clonidine and we drop their pressure from 160 over 100 to 110 over 60 
and they can't keep their eyes open. They can't stand up. You've got to have some of that theory behind it so that people can critically think through it. And I completely, it, I understand, but that's not the theory I'm talking about. I'm talking about when they're talking about like Papalo and stuff like, like the grand scheme of, yeah. of like nursing and like the how grand we theories. evolve. I, but that's, that's where this comes from though. To me, you're talking more like the, the mid range, like the middle part of the theory, like the critical thinking aspect versus like an aspect of nursing in general. That's the part I'm like, I, I, I didn't want as much as that. I, well, I didn't you may care not so want much it, but you need it. I'm going to but, disagree with you. I think you need it no, because if you're going to apply a mid range, you've got to be able to understand some of the grand theory. But I, I, I think at the ADN level, I would much rather us be focused on the actual nuts and bolts. And I'm okay with being able to have the bigger, bigger view. I'm just saying, I still think at that level that we should still be more focused on the hands-on experience. I want the guy focused more on starting the IV and knowing when he needs to start the IV and understanding the implications of how, when, why, all the all that versus what's going to happen a year from now. That's what I guess I mean is I want I want the actual hands on stuff being the ADN focus. OK, so when you're talking ADN, are you talking sitting for RN boards or LPN yes. boards? RN. OK, so Two year what RN. you're talking about that hands on that hands on it are those LVNs and those LPNs the licensed vocational nurses, licensed practical nurses. Mm -hmm. And that is primarily focused on skill. Now, Correct. all due respect to the folks who've gone through those programs, I did not. So I can't speak completely to it. We need those folks. Correct. So when I was precepting as an ICU nurse and I would get a new grad, if I had somebody who started off as an LPN, their skill set was amazing, but they couldn't think through the problem. Some could, some couldn't, but for the most part, they weren't getting that, that theory, that background, that understanding. The RNs, when they came on, they didn't have the same physical hands-on skills, but they could think through things in a much more effective manner and recognize things. Now you give them both 18 months and they end up at the same spot with- Okay, that's what- skill sets improving and knowledge base improving from the LPN. But if you're talking straight out of the school, if you're wanting somebody who can start that IV first try every time, get the catheter placed, lickety split, get an NG tube drop down, you're looking at more of an LPN skill or an LVN skill. If you're looking at somebody, if you're wanting somebody who can say that person is starting to crump a little bit, they are not getting the urine output we need to look at what their blood pressure is. Uh, we need to check on I mean arterial pressure. Are they getting renal perfusion? That is the RN. That's the BSN. That's what they are coming out with. That's where we want them to be. Well, now, the expectation for from a nurse who's been on the unit for 20 years is that both of these people come out being able to start the IV and being able to recognize something a little bit more esoteric. And so that's where we go back to that, that unit culture type piece and retraining that and having some experienced nurses say, Hey, this isn't helpful just because it happened to us, just yes. because it happened to you. It's not helpful. So would you rather focus on the recognition and then focus on the skill while on the job or focus on the skill and then teach them recognition as they go along? If you had your way. Yeah. Would you rather, Ideally, would you rather build up LP? Well, so because the, the program Ben and I went through was you went through LPN, your first year was an LPN and then you could sit for LPN boards and then you went through your RN. So like we kind of got the best of both worlds right off mm -hmm. the bat. So maybe that's why I'm, I'm it, it's difficult for me to understand because like, that's kind of the process we went through is we went through that stepwise. Like I did that. And then I did that. And then I did that. So maybe, in maybe each, it's a little. And each piece built on it. Yeah. And, and so obviously not every school is like that. So 
maybe that's maybe that's the ultimate problem is should there be a standard way every school needs to function? Well, I think when we look when we're outside of it and out and having been in practice and we look back and say, oh, gosh, we got to see this. We got to see this. We got to see this. We're looking back through educated eyes. How do you separate out where you were? And, and we'll go one step further. How old were you? in general, when you graduated from your LPN, ADN, BSN programs, were you younger or not more of a non-traditional student? See, I was, more, I was non-traditional. And again, that's what makes this a different story for me is mm -hmm. I was an older male who had been through some things in my life. So mm -hmm. some of these things that a 21 year old male or female, I was like, that's not going to phase me the same way that it does them. So I, under, I, I recognize that I have a different outlook on being a rookie nurse than someone mm -hmm. that is truly a rookie nurse went through. And I did too. I was a non-traditional student. I get, I went bachelor's degree and graduated. I think I was, I was near 30 yeah. when I graduated with my bachelor's degree. So I, came onto the unit with different life experience. But when we had a new grad who was in their early twenties, mm -hmm. there was a lot of confidence building and trying to, I mean, part of it's you're trying to teach and I hope you guys get lots of messages for this one. You're trying to teach people how to be an adult yeah, because they've been thrown into a whole new universe where they're responsible for somebody's life. Yeah. And in nursing school, we get that we're taking care of a patient, we're taking care of somebody's life, but we are so focused on that goal, on what that grade is, what that clinical skill that we have to learn is, that we lose yep. sight of that big picture until we get onto that unit and, oh crap, I'm oh, responsible yeah. for six people, seven people. Yeah. That is a whole different responsibility. And that's where, all right, our, we go back to the, experience in the change of culture, but that's got to start with more of our intermediate nurses and our more experienced nurses that can stand up for younger nurse and say, instead of fussing at them, instead of messing with them, take a minute and show them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would you change if you had the ability for a BSN program? I will start in just saying that I think in some of the experience that I have seen, I think there's this false narrative in, in a BSN culture that you're going to come out and go straight into management uh, or you're going to, you know, you're not going to be a floor nurse and you're not going to be wiping asses. You're not going to be doing everything that those ADN nurses are doing. And I really wish that some BSN students had the same zeal that ADN students seem to have as far as wanting to get that hands-on experience. I mean, you have an extra two years to continue to build the critical thinking that Jeff's talking about, but also continue to build the skills that Tom's talking about. And sometimes I think that the skills fall by the wayside because we are, like I said, we're giving them this false narrative of, well, you're going to be a BSN and so you're going to be more educated and therefore you'll be the manager of the entire unit and you'll, you won't have to deal with, all the other bullshit. So and that was that, not the impression that I got in my program, in my training, that we were any better or, and, and I know you didn't say better. I'm just, I'm going to put words in your right. mouth here that we were any better or more advanced nurses because we had a bachelor's degree. If you, to step back, you both did the LPN to RN to BSN. So you guys actually had multiple years of skill training. And when you're going back to do the RN to BSN program, there's not nearly as much hand-on It's primarily theory. True. When you are doing your bachelor's degree straight on, so you did your two years of undergraduate that were prerequisites for a bachelor degree, a bachelor's in nursing, we don't have that two years of skill building. We don't have the one year of skill building. We are starting from the bottom, most of us, 
having never truly taken a blood pressure unless we worked as a CNA someplace, ever, having never really been exposed to any of this. And so now we have to learn both theory and skill and this, and in a very limited time frame and with very limited resources. So I think that when you're talking about which would you like to see taught more, you really have to look at where, again, where students are coming into the program, what their background is. Can you require them to be a CNA? I don't think that's realistic because then you're asking them to possibly sit out a semester of school. And most nursing programs now, the semester before or the summer before, require their students to go through some sort of CNA training to get some of the keister wiping and and bed baths and here's how you check a blood pressure and here's how you take a temperature and here's how you check a pulse and here's how you get count respiration so that they can start off with some more advanced skills instead of spending the first six weeks of school teaching the basic these basic basic skills that we take for granted now i truly appreciate the bsn i i think it's a valuable tool in nursing and i i also think I've seen a lot of what Ben, I've, I've been in multiple hospitals. I, I've moved around a bunch. I mean, and I mean, from multiple States, I've, I've seen different cultures and I have seen more of what Ben has said. I, I think it's also, an, it's, I think it's an individual thing though. I don't think it's a True. program based. I think it's I that some people just think that they have a bachelor so that they are better than you. And I don't think it would matter though, if it was, in marketing or nursing, they just have more letters. So therefore they think you're, they're a better person. So maybe that's just them. I would say my, what I would like to change. And I know I've said this before is while I think the bachelors of nursing is very important. And I think education is always something that we should strive to have every nurse get more of i really wish there was a m bigger emphasis on the skill-based nursing first before the educational based nursing such as if you're in the er i would ret rather have an adn with a cen than a bsn if you're in the icu i'd much rather have them have their ccrn than a bsn i would much rather see that first and then have us focus on them continuing the university type education after they've done their professional education. I think we keep pushing this narrative that this is how it feels to me is that you're not a real nurse unless you're a BSN. And that's how it felt as an ADN is like, you're not a real nurse unless you you get your BSN. That's on the, I'll tell you some of the best nurses, the probably three of the best nurses I ever met were ADNs. They were just outstanding people and they had no one whatsoever to go back and get their BSNs. And it always just struck me like, and, and I don't mean, but see, that's the thing is we have our graduate education and we know better, but I'm telling you right now that there are people that have their ADNs that the ANA is telling them that, they're not a real nurse because they don't have their BSN. And that's what they hear. Is that what's being said or is that, what, is that what's being heard? That's not what's directly being said, but when everything is directed around, you need to go back and get your BSN, that's the message that they're hearing. And I would tell you that if it was one person, I would be like, dude, but literally every ADN I know is like, well, you know, I got to go back and get my BSN. Obviously, there is a cultural shift that we are putting such an emphasis on the BSN. And I and I agree that an education is never a bad thing. But why are we not putting that same emphasis on actually, like I said, if you're in the ER, why are we not pushing them to get their CEN first and their BSN second? Who are you saying is pushing the BSN? Is it educators while folks are in school or is it the employer? Or is it just the it's, culture? I think it's the culture. This feels like a, an overreaching cultural issue. Most of the, 
unless I know that there are hospital systems that push for BSNs when they're going for like their magnet status. But again, you can also go back to that's a cultural issue because they set it up so that you can't even become a magnet without having all BSNs. So again, that falls back to if nursing as a whole said, Hey, BSNs are great. We totally and wholeheartedly support nurses going back and getting their education and we can support the good reasons for it. But there are good things about other specific job focused education that perhaps we should be looking at. Again, I am pro BSN. I I knew from the minute I went into nursing, I wanted to get my BSN, but I, I feel like there was such an emphasis on the BSN that sometimes it, it, it feels like the act of nursing gets lost if you don't have a BSN after your name and it says RN. It's almost like RN has now become lost by the wayside. And I find that that's sad in a lot of ways. So Jeff, what would you change in a BSN program if you could? I would like to see a way to incorporate more skill and reinforce more by skill, physical skills and de-emphasize testing and test results as the measure, but we've got to have a measure somewhere. So I, I get that piece, but to teach people to think, and I think that's, that's the hardest piece. And I think that's where as more experienced nurses, we fail younger nurses is because our expectation is for folks to be able to walk on whether we, whether we fully admit it or not, our expectation is for folks to be able to walk onto the unit and practice like we do at the level we do out of the gate, or at least be able to think through those pieces out of the gate. And they haven't been taught that they haven't had that opportunity. They've had it to some extent, but to really get that experience, you're, your ADNs aren't getting it. Your LPNs aren't getting it, your BSNs aren't getting it. And honestly, I really don't think that we started getting a lot of that until we got into graduate programs. We got bits and pieces here and there, but the change in emphasis from the undergraduate programs into a graduate program and what the expectations are, are night and day different. And what I see in having one child who is a sophomore in college and one child who is a junior in high school, I see the education that they're receiving and it is not preparing them to do what we do. It is not preparing them to be good students and it's not preparing them how to think. Hmm. So I, I, sorry, Tom, let me cut you off. No, it's Jeff, just hindsight being 2020, if you had the ability to, would you go back and get your two-year ADN and get your RN and then go RN to BSN if you had the ability to? And there's no wrong answer. I'm not like, like if you say yes or no, I'm like, well, screw you. And or, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious what. It's interesting because my path to nursing was very different, was unusual. I was an EMT first and then worked in an office as a phlebotomist and went and did 18 months to become a medical assistant. And from that medical assistant, I planned on doing LPN and then RN and then BSN and then whatever was next. And to me, I recognized that the path to where I wanted to go, what did not lie in keeping these small steps in between. For me, it, that wasn't the way I was wired. So when I was ready to go, I was ready to go back and just do it. So I, I can't, I don't have a great answer for you on that one. Other than I did the stuff that came before just a little bit differently. And right. so still step through it. But by the time I was ready to get my bachelor's degree, I was ready to get my bachelor's degree. And I had, I had that drive. I had that motivation and I could see, I could see why it was important. 
I can't see Jeff going back and doing it different. As a matter of fact, if he went back in time, I could just see him going back and be like, do you know who I am? I'm going to write a paper <laughs> that wins like author of the year. Shouldn't you just give me my DNP? Like, why am I even getting a BSN at this point? Like, that's what I imagine. If, if I truly had a do over, because I did, um, I did two years of undergraduate and then dropped out of school. And I actually started off as a secondary English education major and even did some student teaching when I discovered I really was not wired to teach high school English. <laughs> wow. I don't, I, God love those people that are though. But I basically picked education because I figured I was uh, going to tick off my parents because I wasn't picking medicine. And so at that age and that stage of my life, the goal was what can I do that's for me and who cares about anything else? My hindsight do over I probably would have gone to medical school. That being said, looking back, I can't see me being happy as a physician. I can't, I just can't because of the way I'm wired and the way I'm wired to care for people. Not that physicians don't care for, for people, but physician training is very different than nursing training. True. And even after we move past the undergraduate level and into masters and NP and DNP, we still approach patients with a nursing spirit and a nursing heart. And we are looking at a whole person and we are looking at a whole family. I think that medical education, physician education has redirected to emphasize more of a ho holistic approach to care, but this is where we're trained from the beginning. And I think that's one of the things that makes us very good clinicians. Interesting. Tom, you look like you're deep in thought. <laughs> we're just wondering what kind of cereal I'm going to eat when we're done. <laughs> I'm joking. That's such a dick. <laughs> well, you know, He's let's wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> Jesus, Jeff knows everything. So. <laughs> Let's wrap up this uh, ADN BSN education episode of us just kind of uh, free balling on our thoughts of. Uh, <laughs> mm. the, uh, yeah. The old free ball in the nursing thoughts. Yeah. 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 So our, our next episode will I'm sure be a, a whole lot more heated and contested. free. Just let them <laughs> just letting the, the ideas flow out in the wind. And free and balling. Yeah. So <laughs> if you like this episode, reach out to us. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube at just some podcast or the web, www.justsomepodcast.com. Email us. Tell us your thoughts. What are your thoughts on the ADN and BSN programs? What would you change if you had the ability to? Are we wrong? Are you right? Let us know. Admin at just some podcast.com. Incorrect. I'm never wrong. Except other, other than when his lips move. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we can mute him so yeah. <laughs> all right guys well uh jeff we appreciate you coming on and uh, giving us your opinion. i loved it anytime guys well good you got to come back for part two so. <laughs> part two part 2.5 part three because uh yeah, this okay. was enough, and this was just adn and bsn so i'm sure msn and dnp is probably going to go we may sure oh, yeah out. It's yeah, good. there might be a part two and three. So, yeah, <laughs> I suspect that uh, uh, we have some opinions and uh, I, I'm, uh, we might ruffle feathers next week. I don't know. So you two might not. I might, though. So of the culture as a whole, we might ruffle some feathers. I think there'll be a lot of people. OK, who fair. Us, so. And maybe if there's something you want to say that you can't say, you'll just write it down and hold it up to the camera and then. I'll say it. So <laughs> <laughs> have to write it backwards though. <laughs> write it in crown. <laughs> Spell it in big words. <laughs> Tell them so you have to do it that way. To um, he, to he, the, the five letters or for five letters or less. Yeah, exactly. One syllable. So One syllable. are we we don't have the uh five questions? You didn't modify your five questions this time? No. Oh, they look like they both been put on the spot. No, we, we <laughs> so already asked you. We need five new questions. 
No, same five questions. No, same five questions. <laughs> I'm not giving you the answer. You can rewind. <laughs> exactly. Just, <laughs> just edit in. Yeah. Just edit in the old episode. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, again, Jeff, we appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again uh, to cover the next couple parts of the education episodes, and we'll see uh, where we go from there. So on that note, uh, I hope everybody has a great week. Hey, everybody, stay safe out there. We're just remember. But swearing just to pass the time. Really big. Lately, I see why I am alone. Some road bridge and I thought of you And all the many times You say I should have known